You know, last night we told you this story about Otto Coleman. Six-year-old Otto Coleman. Now, there's been a lot of debate about vaccines. And in case you, and, and whether or not, I mean, the big debate is whether or not as a parent, you should have your God-given rights as a parent to say, you know, listen, I'm not going to get my child vaccinated. Why? And I know we discussed this the other night, but this is a new twist on things. And um, they say that there are th- people that would say, well, it, you know, it causes autism. It causes various health problems for kids. And, and they could deal with that for the remainder of their lives. Other people say, you know what? Listen, you need to get your kid vaccinated. And we had some very interesting arguments the other night about this both ways. We had someone who called up and said, listen, if you don't get your kid, if, if, if you're, if all the other kids in the classroom are vaccinated and mine isn't, what are they worried about? They're already vaccinated. Well, then someone called up. I, th- I think it was Judy called up and said, yeah, but listen, there's seniors. Maybe there's other people out there that the kid is going to be around, come in contact with, whatever, that maybe have not been vaccinated against certain things. So it was an interesting debate. And then now the debate, of course, is. You know, whether or not it is your constitutional right as a parent to say, no, I'm not going to get my kids vaccinated. Well, the big news today is that um, the bill was signed by the governor. Governor Jerry Brown, wasting no time, signs the contentious California bill to impose one of the strictest school vaccination laws in the country after an outbreak of measles at Disneyland that we're all aware of late last year. Uh, the governor issuing a, 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 a issued a signing statement uh, just one day after the lawmakers sent him to sent him the bill strike California's personal belief exemption for immunizations a move that requires nearly all public school children to be vaccinated and that bill will take effect next year. The science, the governor says, is clear that the vaccines dramatically protect children against a number of infectious and dangerous diseases. And while it is true that no medical intervention is without risk, the evidence, says the governor, shows that the immunization powerfully benefits and protects the community. Then I told you last night, as I was alluding to, that this six-year-old who's paralyzed, this boy, delivered 65,000 anti-SB-277 signatures to the governor. Otto Coleman, six years old, from Roseville, California, paralyzed from the waist down uh, from vaccine-induced... Well, I'll tell you what, his father's here. Josh Coleman is here. Josh, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. I'm I'm well. Thanks for coming into the studio tonight. So here's your young... Here's your your little six-year-old Otto. Nice picture of what a cute little guy, too. Yeah. So you take him to the the Capitol, and he delivers 65,000 signatures. First of all, I appreciate you being here. Tell us how that went yesterday or last night. Oh, that was actually in the in the early day. And yeah, it was 65,000 uh, signatures petitioning against SB 277, which was actually more than double uh, the size of the peti- petition that was for it. And uh, we went to the governor's office. And interestingly enough, when we went in there, the secretary excused herself. And about a minute later, uh, the police officer who was out front came in and said, oh, no, you have to take these to the mailroom. You can't leave anything here. And so we stepped out and we were trying to figure out where the mailroom was. And somebody else walked up uh, to the door to deliver something. And he said, oh, no, you need to take that to the mailroom. And they looked at him really confused and went, when did that start? Oh. <laughs> and I thought, I thought maybe five minutes ago right. when we got here. Really? Right. And that's when I thought, okay, I think he's going to sign tomorrow. So, in other words, these people had been there before. They kind of knew the procedure. Mm-hmm. And, and But, well, wait a second. We may, we may have to take these to the mail room because you're standing there. Guy doesn't want to sound like a chump. He's telling you and your son that these need to go to the mail room. Yeah. But apparently that doesn't go for everyone. That person was confused, yeah. Yeah. And, and no, it's like, why, why not just accept it? Especially you got a six-year-old here in a wheelchair. Say, okay, thank you. Set them down. And that's all she had to do, but... Instead, they sent us away. So, and then in your mind, you're thinking, okay, he's, he's going to sign tomorrow. Oh, yeah. That's what I thought. And, and he did. And he did. Yeah. You were absolutely right. So, tell us the kind of battle that you've been. First of all, let's go back to your son, Otto. Right. Tell us the story. You go, they say, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing. Is this is Otto your only child? Do you have other children? No, I have a four-year-old named Fenton. Okay, so you... <sighs> You're doing what a good parent is supposed to do, at least we think. Sure. Many people would, and you admit, many people would say 
listen, you know, it's the right thing to do as a parent is to get your your child uh, vaccinated. Right. So you're just trying to, to do what you're supposed to do. So take us through what happened with Otto. Well, you know, I, you know when, my, when my wife was pregnant, we started to research vaccines because we had heard different things. And we were very quickly overwhelmed and thought, all right, we're just going to test the doctor on this one. And uh, yeah, at about 17 months, he ended up with a vaccine injury. And uh, it's called transverse myelitis. And basically, to break it down, his immune system got confused and started to attack his spinal cord and did permanent damage. And the unfortunate thing is after that happened, when the doctors, at first it was a major suspicion, that was the first thing they said. But, you know, and they're supposed to contact VAERS, that's a vaccine adverse system, and uh, they never did that. And the, and the scary thing is, is the reason why they need to report it is because if somebody else is reacting like this to the same vaccine in another state, Maybe they need to pull that vaccine so that doesn't happen again. But they didn't do that. Um, so that was unfortunate. But it wasn't until about uh, December 2013 until it was absolutely confirmed that it was uh, a vaccine injury. And it was at that time I started to research vaccines more. And I started to see some things I thought were careless. You know, the vaccine companies actually were absolved of liability in 1986. And if you look, they started cranking them out after that. I'm 41 years old, and uh, when I was a kid, I got one-third of the vaccines that are out today. You might have got even less than I did. And uh, so, yeah, they've... they've what they've, are you saying? I'm an old man. Listen, <laughs> invite this guy, and he goes, no, I'm just teasing you. You got a couple years on me. <laughs> I had a couple years on you. That's all right. That's all right. Um, so, yeah, so now they have more vaccines. So, would you, so he started, Otto then started to... Uh, <laughs> How did it affect him and affect his life and your life? Yeah, overnight, he, he became paralyzed, you know, could, could, couldn't walk. And, uh, you know, he can't even uh, relieve himself like a regular person. You know, we, we use a catheter four times a day to, oh to facilitate that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's devastating. And, uh, you know, now it's a part of our life and it's uh, an everyday thing. And, um, you know, I'm not bitter about it. But, you know, when I do see... Uh, the vaccine companies being careless, I have to think, had they been more careful and uh, more thorough research, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And, that, and that's upsetting. I have a few more questions. We're talking to Josh Coleman. He is the father of Otto Coleman, this young man who, hey boy, six years old, who took the, uh, uh, the signature, 65,000 signatures to the governor yesterday, to the mail room where they properly were. You know, take it to the mail room, and then uh, hopefully the governor looked through those before he made his swipe with his pen today. I have some more questions for you. Can you stick around a couple of minutes here? As long as you like. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our conversation. Let me ask you this, because there's there are going to be people, obviously, and you've done your research, you know this, there's going to be people that disagree with you. Of course. And you've been doing research on that. Yes. Would you feel comfortable... If someone would like to join the conversation. Absolutely. You would? Yes. Okay. Well, with that in mind, then uh, I don't want to make our guests feel uncomfortable. So he's willing to discuss this with you if you're a parent and uh, you feel very strongly one way or the other. I'd love to hear from you. And maybe you have a question for Josh. I have a few myself. You're invited to call. I'll give you the phone number 921-1530. 921-1530 or 1-800-834-1530. We'll continue our conversation right here on the Pat Wall Show. It's 820. It's the Pat Walsh Show. News Radio KPK joined in studio by Josh Coleman. He is the father of Otto Coleman, six-year-old dude. In his wheelchair, took 65,000 signatures. He's basically paralyzed from the waist down. Took 65,000 signatures to the uh, governor to opposing SB 277, the mandatory vaccination bill that, that we've been talking about. As I mentioned, the governor wasting no time in signing that bill today, saying that the science is clear the vaccines dramatically protect children against a number of infectious and dangerous diseases. And Joss is here to tell us his story of Otto, and we've been talking about that and how the vaccination affected him. Now, 
Um, again, in doing your research, Josh, you, you, obviously you know that people are going to say, and the, again, the, the debate is that if you're a parent, you should have the right to determine whether or not you want your children uh, vaccinated or not. And then other people are going to be on, uh, very vehemently arguing, saying, no, they should be. You need to, It's not only about you or your child and your rights, it's about the rest of our rights as well. And uh, when you were reading and doing your research, you had to see a lot of pros for getting vaccination. Did any of those stand out to you? Uh, did you did you vaccinate your daughter, your four year old? Uh, a little boy. Um, oh, I'm sorry, your boy. I'm sorry. Yeah, we we gave him one round, and he uh, he got really sick afterwards, Kidding. and not nothing permanent, but he he did have a funky re- reaction, and at that point, we thought we're going to hold off. We're not going to do this anymore. But everything's been okay. Every, he's from fine. Then. That's right. So, did anything stand out to you when you're doing your research that said, "Well, you know, maybe"? Obviously, it did because you've gone through this experience with your first son. Now, your second son comes along. You saw what happened with your first son, Otto. You had to be very concerned about doing this again. Well, and they talk about susceptibility, and some people are more susceptible to vaccine injury than others. And so, my thought was. If Otto was susceptible, maybe Fenton is. And then after that reaction, after the first round, I thought, geez, you know, that really could happen. But, you know, a really good friend of mine, Laura Hayes, uh, I was actually writing that for a speech and I was talking about susceptibility. And she said, you know what? There's nothing wrong with Otto and there's nothing wrong with Fenton. It's the vaccines. They're not for everybody. And it's not about some people are genetically predisposed. The vaccines are not good enough for every single human. It's, it's not a one size fits all vaccine okay. medication okay we well, said you take a couple of phone calls uh, from listeners let's uh we got bill and doug right now on the line let's go to elk grove first and we'll talk to uh, doug's been waiting the longest doug you're on the pat wall show with uh, josh coleman hey josh i just want to thank you for your efforts and i just congratulate your son what a little hero walking into the governor's office like that that's are, are actually being wheeled in unfortunately um thank you i i just would like to suggest that Maybe you should turn around and uh, pack that back up and take it to Dr. Pan's office with uh, some cameras and let's see what his reaction is because he's pretty accessible. I mean, he's a pediatrician right here in town. His wife is also. And uh, uh, I don't know if his uh, handlers will be there to kind of make decisions for him because that's what happened. And his drug reps were right behind him when when they were ready to vote and the vote wasn't going to go his way. They gave him another week to turn it around and say, well, you can just homeschool your kids. So... Uh, the chiropractors are a little upset with this, and we're not going to vaccinate our kids. So um, if you go to a convention in some nice hotel, you'll see you'll see a lot of uh, kids running around. And if it's a chiropractic convention, you can pick out the chiropractic kids from the regular kids because they just have a different look. So right. uh, we don't vaccinate. And uh, the, the evidence is there. You can go to the doctorwithin.com. That's Tim O'Shea goes all over the country teaching about this, and uh, he's done the work, and he's looked at the evidence, he's looked at the studies, and it's it's just not there. It's not it's not what they say, and uh, this is the biggest sham that's ever been perpetrated on on a on a state. It's just amazing. I if you go back to the Nuremberg trials, um, there had to be consent. That's why those guys were hung. You had to have consent. To, to experiment on people, and that's what they're trying to do. So, I'll 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 be quiet and I'll shut up now. But this, you were really upset, the whole chiropractic community. So I right. just want to tell you that, and we're behind you. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for the call. Well, there you go, some support. Yeah. Your side. Let's go to uh, Bill in Sacramento. Bill, you're on with uh, with uh, Josh Coleman on the Pat Wall Show. Hey Pat, how you doing? Good. Good to hear, good to hear you again tonight. And uh, Josh, I'm really sorry about your son getting transverse myelitis. That that really sucks. Um, can I ask you when did he first get his first vaccination? How old was he? Uh, you know, I don't remember. Um, you know, he might have gotten. You know, if you want to count the vitamin K, uh, probably five minutes after he was born. Oh my God! Um, yeah, when I was growing up, I'm a little older, early, you know, like Pat here. So, uh, you know, uh, when we were growing up, we didn't get our first vaccinations until we were like six months old. And there was a reason for that, that the, the blood-brain barrier is not fully intact until you're six months old. So when you're giving these vaccinations at earlier and earlier stages of life, um, you're exposing the brain and the spinal cord to uh, more, more of these dangerous substances like the formaldehyde and some of the other cancer-causing stuff that's in the vaccinations as well, um, besides just the bugs that are in there to, to pump up your immune system. So 
that's kind of what I wanted to say in the uh, First Amendment issue, the freedom of religion. The only people that can uh, violate our civil rights are, like, uh, the government, anybody that's uh, from the government. I can't violate my neighbor's civil rights. It's impossible for me to do that as a private citizen. So when people are saying that we need to vaccinate our kids because they have rights, too, I can't violate their rights. So that, that argument is mute. Right. Bill, thank you for the call, man. Thanks for listening. You know, I w- I'd like to point something out really quick because they keep talking about the unvaccinated. And, uh, but it's a very deceptive term that they've been using. Uh, less than 1% of the people in California have no vaccines whatsoever. So the, so the people they're calling unvaccinated, they're actually partially vaccinated. You know, a lot of people don't get the hepatitis B for their child. You know, if they're not breastfeeding and sexually active or their, chi- their six-year-old isn't sexually active, why get it? And at least, why not wait? And, uh, you know, and, and a person missing the hepatitis B vaccine, one vaccine will be titled unvaccinated, and it's deceptive. So even though you get a vaccine, it's just part of the stages of vaccines. You are unva- categorized as unvaccinated. Right. There's 69 vaccines right now. 69. 69? Yeah. Yeah, you probably got less than 20. Yeah. Well, that was and back then, in the 1800s. We do, didn't have all those diseases when I was a kid. Do you have any friends or relatives that, that were susceptible to, uh, that got diseases? What do, you, what do you think back going, we should have had more of those? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, it's a it's an g- excellent question. Let's go to Tammy and Carmichael. I can't answer your question, so I'm going <laughs> to Tammy right now. Tammy, uh, you're on the Pat Wall Show with uh, Josh Coleman. Great. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to say, as a mother of seven... And we have chose not to vaccinate. We did a lot of research. And I am sure, just like families, there are a thousand different opinions, a thousand different dynamics to the way you raise your kids and what all you do. But I think we should always have the choice, always have the choice as the parent to decide what's best. And that is not the government's decision to make, not state or federal, when it comes to raising your children. So are you going to be doing the homeschooling now? Or how are your, kid, or are your kids grown up? Are they still young um, enough to be in school? I started 15 years ago. I have one that's graduated and two that are graduated, actually, and five in the works. <laughs> okay, so in, and now what do you think of the fact that, the, uh, that they can basically just, if you, your kids aren't vaccinated, you have to do the homeschooling? Can't well, send them to public schools. I would, I would challenge um, maybe that info because from everything I understood, it applies equally to homeschoolers. It is not just to public school kids. That's what the homeschool community that I'm aware of, we've all understood it. It applies to us as well. Hmm. All right. Well, Tammy, thank you for your phone call. Thanks for listening. Uh, Let's talk to Justin before we get to the news. Justin, you're on the Pat Wall Show with uh, Josh Coleman. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask Josh, like, what he would say. I know a lot of people are calling you guys anti-vaxxers and calling you uneducated. How do you answer to that? I, you know, I say I'm pro-choice, and I think if somebody wants to fully vaccinate, they should go ahead and do that, and that's their decision. And I think if somebody wants to not vaccinate at all or partially vaccinate, that's their choice. And, you know... California is at an all-time high for vaccinations right now, and this is when we're going to mandate it? It doesn't make any sense. You know, what's interesting in, is, like, in 1961, Pat Brown, Governor Brown's father, started the first personal belief exemption in California, and it's been around for 54 years. And now that we're at an all-time high of vaccinations, now it's going to be mandated. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it just seems like Nazi America to me. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm all about the conspiracies. I I appreciate your fight, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, that's not Dave. Dave's up next. I forgot who it was. I just hung up on him. Thank you for your phone call. Um, and there is a twist to this. All right, there's a the the so the anti-vaccine doctor. The guy, the guy that was behind the dangerous autism therapy, I told you the night I had a doctor tell me, man, you need, don't get it because it causes autism. Don't get your kids vaccinated. There's a twist to the story regarding him. That's coming up. Bottom of the hour news first. It is 830. Bottom of the hour news, News Radio, KPK's Cindy Baker. 
38. Welcome back. Pat Wall Show. I'm Pat. News Radio KPK. We're talking to Josh Coleman, whose son Otto, uh, age six now, delivered the 65,000 signatures to the governor last night, opposing SB 277. The governor decided today, oh, well, I'm still going to sign it. Still putting the ink to the paper, and I'm signing this. Amy writes, you know, my kids were fine, but what about the teachers? And I'll ask Josh this question as well. What about the teachers, the bus drivers, lunch ladies, et cetera, who may uh, be older, not of those vaccines like we did as kids? Or some of the vaccines now that uh, they're giving to kids, they, they weren't vaccinated for those things, as as uh, Josh pointed out, us folks that were, you know, back in the uh, early 1900s, we got our vaccinations, and now they got, you know, a bunch more that we were required to get. Uh, so that's from Amy. And then Heather writes, really appreciate you letting Josh Coleman onto your show to present the other side of the story. Well, you're very welcome. So, Josh, let's get take another phone call. Let's talk to Dave in Sacramento. Dave, you're on the Pat Wall Show. Hi, hey, Pat. This is your buddy, uh, Dave Gaines, the chief executive officer of the Sacramento Autistic Spectrum and Special Needs Alliance. Hey, nice to hear from you, Dave. Thanks. Dave? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yeah. What's okay? okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, working uh, in the field of uh, kids with mental diagnoses for a long time, uh, particularly uh, kids on the autistic spectrum. Um, I have uh, been around this discussion for quite some time. Uh, and this particular uh, bill, the vaccine bill that recently passed was uh, quite a topic of discussion amongst some of the families that um, that uh, I work with. Um, I was I had a quick question for uh, for Josh. Is he still there? I'm here. Yeah. yeah. OK, uh, Josh, uh, you're you you stated your uh, your son was vaccinated at 17 months. How long after the 17 month vaccination uh, did he um, uh, have the symptoms of paralysis? Full paralysis. It was per, full paralysis was about it was over three weeks, but he was having difficulty walking. And since he was 17 months old, he had just learned how to walk. So the difficulty that he was having because of what was going on, because of the damage, we thought was just him playing around and figuring himself out. Right. Um, thank you for, for the answer. I, I read your statement that you uh, gave to the, uh, the uh, I guess, the Assembly or maybe Senate committees, uh, and I, I didn't notice uh, the exact timeline there, so I was curious. Thank you for, for clarifying that. One thing I, I also want to um, I want to stress, uh, I had a professor uh, of philosophy when I was working on my bachelor's degree, and, and he used a wheelchair as well. His legs were paralyzed. Um, as an adult, he, he, uh, he came down with post-polio syndrome. So he actually got polio, which there is a vaccine for. And um, after that, uh, he, he lost usage of his legs and uh, used the wheelchair. So I, I, want, I think it's interesting to point out that we have an individual who lost usage of their legs due to vaccines, and then we had an individual who lost usage uh, of their legs due to a vaccine-preventable uh, diagnosis. So the same thing can happen with, um, uh, you know, the, the polio disease as, as well as uh, possibly from, from vaccines. Um, and I will tell you that this professor uh, is an extremely inspirational person to me. Um, and, I, and I want you to know that uh, what, what Otto's situation, by no means does your son uh, now have a lower quality, uh, an opportunity, you know, a potential to have a, he has potential to have uh, a equal uh, high quality of life as, as anybody else. And being a person with a disability doesn't make him uh, any less uh, than anybody else. And he's, his life is not destroyed and, and he's not a burden. Um, and, and I encourage you and I, I hope that you uh, teach your son his, his uh, equal value to everybody else and the full uh, potential that he has to live uh, an extremely fulfilling life. The professor I work for, he's, He's married. He has a Ph.D. He's paid well. Uh, he's very athletic. He participates in sports. And his disability in no, no means reduces the quality of his life. Um, and he's, he's a remarkable human being. I don't know uh, Josh that well. I've just met him tonight, but I would uh, venture to guess 
Dave, that uh, you seem like a kind of guy that's probably said all those things to your son. Oh, yeah. He's, you know, he's actually doesn't really care and doesn't really know anything's going on and has never asked, which is really bizarre. And before going into kindergarten, I thought, I need to have the talk with him about what's going on before some idiot kid says something bad. And that's the first thing he's heard about what's going on with him. And so I sat him down and tried to sort of explain why his legs don't work like everybody else. And he really didn't care. He got bored pretty quick. Oh, really? So, yeah, he doesn't care. And, and I've tried to tell him again before we've been going to these Senate hearings. And I've tried to talk to him again and, and clue him in. And he's, he's, he, now he kind of understands, but it's, he's not bothered by it. He couldn't be a happier kid. And, you know, my testimony that you're talking about, it is pretty dramatic. But, yeah, I don't, I don't, treat, him, uh, I don't treat him as, you know, uh, this poor kid that's having this big trouble. I treat him just like every other kid. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people see him as, you know, when people see him, it's like, oh, or oftentimes all they talk about is his disability. But he's a really funny, creative, wonderful kid. And he's 100 percent upstairs and uh, having a wonderful life. Yeah, the uh, the pity part of it is is really a shame, and and you know um, the passion I put into my work. One of the reasons why I do the work I do is uh, is to get rid of that. Is is to uh, embrace uh, people with disabilities. You know, it's, disability is a natural part of life, and eventually everyone will will experience disability if they get old enough. Uh, and, and it's just a cultural, it's, it's really a cultural thing. And, and people with disabilities uh, bring something very special to uh, our society. They, they teach a lot of values, um, and I can personally attest to this, that uh, you know, can't be learned from other uh, people. Um, I, I guess, Mike, I had a little concern why I mentioned the uh, encouragement of the positivity of uh, your son is, is I did feel that your statement to the, um, the vaccine community was, a little bit negative, and, and I kind of felt it was portraying that your life, your son's life, has been destroyed uh, because of this, and that you know this was a, a hopeless future for him. And um, I, I unfortunately, that is used by organizations like uh, Autism Speaks, for one, um, to to bring in money. They sell the pity story, uh, and it's really it, it's using people with disabilities for uh, for other people's agendas and purposes. And um, I don't think you are you're in and was as sinister as an organization like Autism Speaks, but I did get a little taste of that in there, and it, it, it made my How do you react too. to that, Dave? I mean, uh, Josh? It, it, it is a bit dramatic, the testimony that I had. And, you know, I'm, that was actually, I was supposed to be, uh, that was written for the Senate, and I was trying to drive home, you know, to take vaccine injury seriously. It's a real thing. And, you know, Senator Pan, I won't call him Dr. Pan, Senator Pan, who goes all over television and says vaccines are safe. He makes that statement. It's very socially irresponsible. The, va- uh, the Supreme Court of America actually d- declared vaccines unavoidably unsafe. And it's a major misconception, and it's unfortunate. People need to know that 75 cents of every vaccine that they pay for goes towards a fund for people who die or are injured by vaccines, and people don't know. Dave, I got to get running. I, th- I appreciate you're still listening, and thank you for your phone call tonight. Uh, a couple of more questions for you, and uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions myself, and then I'll, I'll also reveal this other news, which is a twist to the story. That's coming up right here on the Pat Wall Show. It's 852. Welcome back. I was born a house cat. Pat Walsh joined in studio tonight by Josh Coleman. He's uh, fighting uh, on behalf of those people. Well, he he took his son Otto yesterday to the Capitol to deliver the 65,000 signatures, anti-SB 277 signatures of the governor, who then proceeded today to sign that bill. So that's what we've been talking about. Let me ask you this, Josh. Do you think that, uh, just throwing this out there, that... Let's say big money pharmaceuticals is behind any of this. And when you talk about all of these, all the new vaccinations, you think they're all legit? Or are these things that say, hey, you know, uh, over the years, we need a piece of this money. We need a piece of this money. We, we, you know, we need to profit off of this. There are some people that would uh, claim that that's what's going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, they've, uh, they've tripled since I was a kid. They've doubled in the last 10 years. And I don't know what happened 10 years ago to cause them to double. It's crazy. Yeah, it's money. It's big money. You know, at the Senate Education Committee, every time Senator Pan was faced with a decision, 
He referred to somebody, and that was the pharmaceutical lobbyists. Every time he had to make a decision, he asked them, what do I do? What would you say to those parents out there that would say, thank God for this, for this medicine. Thank God, because this has really kept my child safe. And they would tell you that you're in the minority here. We're sorry what happened to your son. It's a beautiful young boy. We're sorry. We feel for you. Right. We can sympathize with you. But the fact is, for most people... This is a good thing that they're eradicating these diseases and that you can get vaccinated or get at least get vaccinated against many of these uh, diseases. You know, I would say look at the reasoning behind SB 277, which was specifically the incident at Disneyland. Now, you know, Disneyland is the second busiest business on the planet. Measles is the most contagious disease on the planet. And what happened? 134 people got a rash, some got a fever, and no one died. That's a success story, but they've been using it as a scare tactic. And, you know, we have nothing to worry about. We're fine. And, and this is it. Mandates are not needed. Like I said, vaccinations are at an all time high and forcing this on somebody who feels that it might not be the safest thing for their child is is wrong. And your your youngest son, he had the he's um, only had one vaccination, one vaccine, one, one round of vaccinations, one round of vaccination. Right. So it didn't deter you with your older son. It didn't deter you from getting your second son vaccinated. Are you not going to get any more vaccinations? For at, at this point? No, no. Uh, you know, vaccines are not thoroughly tested. But, that, yet, but as a parent, you still did it. Well, I had not researched that much quite yet. And, uh, you know, I mean, the first two years after Otto's injury, I was just trying to figure out how to get him uh, as uh, healed up as possible. Do you regret doing this? Yeah, of course. You regret it, really? I do. Do you yeah. feel like you did something wrong as a parent? Or as a parent, you were trying to do the right thing, and it was a, just a misfor- an unfortunate uh, um, accident? You know, and anybody listening to this who's in my, who has a vaccine-injured child, uh, I, I hope you don't blame yourself, and I'm not going to blame myself. It's not our fault. Uh, we, we did what we were told, and we trusted uh, the physicians. And unfortunately, that happened. And uh, like I said, it's not our fault. So I go into this doctor. I told the story the other night. Uh, long story short, and he, hey, do you have kids? I, I don't. Well, if you do, or if you have, have any friends, you tell them not to get their child vaccinated because, well, he gave me all this litany of reasons. Dr. James, uh, Jeffrey uh, Bradstreet, uh, was, he was... Um, to thousands of sports, he was a savior. He was a physician who claimed the vaccines cause autism, promote radical procedures to treat those afflicted, including his own son. To many others, he was a sort of a crackpot, a guy who, despite his medical license, ignored science, championed dangerous, uh, discredited, occasionally deadly treatments. Uh, and now he has been found dead. Yeah. His Very family disturbing. is crying foul now on this. Have right. you heard this? Yeah, I have. Yeah, it's disturbing. You know, I... I, I I absolutely think that vaccines are uh, part of the, it, it, there's a link between the rise in autism and vaccines. Absolutely. And, uh, and I do think that's very suspicious, especially at this time with what's going on right now. So they're investigating this guy's death. And uh, it appears that the interesting thing they're saying that it appears that self-inflicted his family's saying that he's he's set up an online account to raise funds for uh, for this investigation of the possibility of, of foul play. Mm-hmm. So you look at this guy as someone who was doing something positive. He was trying to show you, sort of show you the light, right? Versus what uh, what we're being told all the time. You know what they're not talking about? The lead researcher at the CDC actually just filed for whistleblower status last year. And he's been, he was like the, the lead researcher of the, uh, of the research that said there is no link uh, with this increase in autism to vaccines. And he's saying those tests were done in a specific way to not get those results. Mm. And no one's really talking about it. William Thompson, look him up. And, uh, and here's another guy. There's, there's a lot of research out there linking autism to vaccines. I mean, one out of every 48 people born right now have autism. Josh Coleman, I want to say thanks for coming in and sharing your story with us tonight. Thank you. Um, it, it was very, either way, no matter how you feel about it, it was nice to see you get that stuff. Take your son to the Capitol, get that, get those signatures in him. Um, good effort, and thank you for being part of the show. Thank you. It's a Pat Wall Show. 
So, um, yeah, that's there. Let's, uh, you know, we pr- we like to present both sides of a topic. And so we had Josh in here talking about why he had his son Otto deliver the 65,000 signatures to the governor. And joining us because he was listening to the show, Dr. Davis uh, may, as I take it here, is going to present the other side. Uh, Dr. Davis, thank you for joining the show. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure, Pat. Appreciate that very much. Now, you're calling, you were listening, and so now you called to tell us why it is that people need these vaccinations. Well, Pat, you know, as a physician for over 20 years, part of what I have to do is I have to see both sides of an argument. I have to look at the scientific evidence. I have to decide what's right and wrong for my patients. Now, I happen to deal in the area of physical medicine and rehabilitation, so we take people who are at their lowest of low from either amputation, spinal cord injury, head injury, similar types of scenarios, and we have to try to make them as best as possible. One of the conditions that has hit people in the 20th century was polio. And if you look at what happened when Salk presented his vaccine to preventing the number of patients, there, there, there was a worldwide epidemic associated with polio the amount of people who were dying, who were afflicted with limb injuries, they couldn't move, they couldn't breathe. And then Saul comes along with his vaccine and he ends up making a tremendous change in what happens in our world. And now there's only a fraction of the polio episodes that ever occurred in the 50s. And this clearly changed the entire way that we look at the way the vaccines are made the fact that this helped save millions of lives and everything from that point forward is based upon the fact that we look at how to try to prevent disease. If we don't have these vaccines, it doesn't have to be measles. It doesn't have to be flu. It has to be the fact that people are looking to try to stop disease. Now, the link between autism and vaccines has been thoroughly disproven many times over. And I think that the folks who continue to come back to the table to say, oh, there's a link, there's no question that the person who presented this data falsified his data. He was publicly uh, humiliated over the fact that he, that he presented this data, and everybody knows that it is not, is not scientific fact. Now, we know the people who get afflicted with flu, if they don't get the vaccine, they're about 70% more likely to suffer serious, harmful Uh, consequences. People who don't get the polio vaccine and get polio, there's a chance of either loss of limb, loss of being able to breathe. It's just, it's this litany of how many people are saved by vaccines. There's no question that a small percentage will potentially be affected by negative effects for one reason or the other. The group immunity, the ability to save people's lives with vaccines is immeasurable in comparison to the few that, unfortunately, like you, you take a pill, you take ampicillin, you could get a rash, you could die from an allergic reaction. Are we going to stop putting ampicillin out on the market because of the millions or maybe even at this point billions of people who have been saved by the presence of this antibiotic? I don't think so. And that's kind of my whole approach. I, I thank goodness that, that Dr. Pan and other folks in our legislature have made it so that my children, who happen to be right now at 12 and 14, hopefully will not have to worry about this group immunity scenario. Um, I'm I'm in favor for this. And I I think that our, our, I think our state, I think our country, if we adopt a similar attitude, I think is going to be better for it. Uh, Talking to Dr. Davis right now. Doctor, so when you heard Josh and he was talking about, obviously he is a concerned parent uh, because of what happened with his son. And he was talking about all these vaccinations that we're now dealing with. And uh, I'm just trying to present both sides of the story is 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 you mentioned polio. We all know about polio and the success of polio. What are some when we're up to these all of these other vaccinations now, the ones that maybe you or I didn't have or certainly I didn't have when I was uh, a kid back, uh, uh, you know, back when I was a wee lad there. What are some of the newest vaccinations for that we're dealing with? Well, I think uh, things that are designed towards human papillomavirus, which uh, is something that can afflict children um, and can affect adults, and if you're not protected against it, can potentially cause cancers that are very hard to treat, uh, specifically genital cancers. Um, Tough topic, but 
the data that's out there, at least in terms of what's been looked at, shows that a lot of uh, individuals are now protected against a cancer-causing virus. And I think that the future of similar types of vaccines are going to come about where we may have the ability to immunize against cancers. Um, really? This really? Is one of the first. Yeah, yeah. So HPV or human papilloma human papilloma virus is really one of the first that has been uh, that has been created that is now given to both male and females. As a matter of fact, both of my kids went through this, and I was. I was, you know, first in line to try to get my kids vaccinated against something that that has been shown in about. I, I please don't quote me on the exact numbers, but my understanding is somewhere between ten and thirty percent of individuals who get HPV will go on to develop some type of cancer in the genital area if it's not uh, identified early and treated. I mean, these, wow. these are numbers. You know, these are numbers that. Look, I'm not saying that the science of immunization is perfect. There's no question that we still have light years to go. But we are getting closer and closer to being able to conquer some very horrible diseases. And even diseases that 100 years ago in the time, you know, measles and mumps and rubella, you know, these today we don't see a fraction of those because we've immunized against them. And people say, oh, it's a scourge for us to be vaccinated, but yet they would never understand how bad it would be if they were affected by these viruses. Even the flu. Now, granted, this last year, you know, the World Health Organization did a terrible job. They 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 missed, you know, some 70 percent of the appropriate virus that we needed to get. But you know what? They were doing their job to try to make sure that we stop people from dying from flu. And the fact that approximately 30 percent of our elderly patients who get the flu are going to die. Our kids, about 15 percent under the age of, I want to say, three or five, are going to die if they get a severe case of flu. But yet, if we get the right vaccine, if we get the right numbers, the chances of people dying is just dramatically dropped. The same goes with all these other horrible, terrible illnesses that we now have vaccines for. And I think people... If, if they were living 100 years ago and somebody said, oh, my gosh, we have something to stop this, I think the discussion would be completely different. I really don't think that people would have the same concept that they do today because the people who uh, realized that immunizations were available, they lined up in droves to get these vaccinations despite the fact that they knew that a small percentage of kids were actually you, get So you're thinking back then there would never be this discussion of, well, it's my right as a parent. It, it would be more of, wow, what has science done? What is? Look at the medicines that they're creating. Look at the, the breakthroughs that they are creating to keep our kids and our families safe. Absolutely. That would be the biggest story, as you mentioned, you know, Absolutely. 100 years and ago. Think about, and think about penicillin. The first people who were tested with penicillin may have said the same thing. Oh, my gosh, you can't. Hey, wait a second. I might actually live from this stuff. And people started living longer lives. You know, our, our, our longevity has expanded tremendously because of the advances in science, whether it's antibiotics, whether it's vaccines, whether it's other health-containing uh, treatments. This is all part of the continuum that if we don't have these advances in science and people try, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I, I hate hearing stories of people who have been afflicted, whether it was directly from the vaccine or otherwise. I, I, I feel so badly for those folks, and I know that there's nothing that I can do, and I, and I know that in those cases where the vaccines are, are related to this, I, I understand that there are going to be some folks who are not going to have good outcomes in the, the, the future of protecting the whole of humanity. And it's horrible when the one in a million ends up being your child or your spouse or your significant other. I, I, I don't know what to say to those folks, but I know that I've lined up every single time for myself every year, not just because they force me to get a vaccine, but they tell me, look, you can wear a mask and you can wear that throughout the entire season. But I have actually said, you know what? I'm going to get vaccinated. My kids are going to get vaccinated. My wife is also a physician. She gets vaccinated. Um, we do this and we do it willingly, not because somebody says we have to. Just real because quick, I, just just real quickly, yeah, Doctor yeah. Davis, and not to interrupt yeah. you there, but when, did, I want to I want to see if I heard you if I heard you correctly earlier. You say that seventy so that if you don't get 
the vaccination, let's say say the flu vaccine, all right, the flu shot. Yes. If you don't get it, you, and you, then then the flu is going to be seventy percent worse if you don't get it than if you get it if you take the shot and somehow get the flu. Did I get that right? Oh, Pat, you know I hate to I hate to be quoted on specific numbers, but I know that in the elderly and in the and in the the, the youngest populations, the risk of severe consequences, be it uh, failure of the lungs, failure of the heart. Um, even potential brain damage becomes substantially higher. The, the risk factors, once you get over the age of 60, 65, if you have any other medical issue, heart disease, lung disease, um, other, other medical-related illnesses, your chance of having serious issues, maybe even death jumps up, I want to say at least threefold. Let me ask you this, doctor. Uh, again, here I am interrupting you, but I have to because of uh, sure. my clock here. You, sure. you, you, uh, you have some people very interested. Uh, did you want to hang out for a second and continue conversation? I'm only going to talk about this for a few more minutes, but as I think there's a couple of people who would like to ask you a question. Are you willing to do that? I, you know, I will be glad to do so. I'm actually waiting to pick up my daughter. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, I'll put uh, yeah, you. I'll be glad to do so. All okay. right, thanks. I'll put you on hold. Uh, we'll continue the conversation for just a couple of more minutes here, uh, right here on the Pat Wall Show. Nine twenty one. Glenn Shorick, vocalist for Little River Band, born on this day. It's the Pat Wall Show. We're talking about vaccinations. The governor signing. SB 277 today and making it pretty much mandatory for you to uh, get your children vaccinated. Dr. Uh, uh, Davis has been with us and uh, and uh, continues to join us. Uh, and I sure do appreciate that, Dr. Davis. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Pat. Hey, I got a couple of uh, people that want to join a discussion, if you don't mind here. Let's talk to uh, John's been on hold the longest. John, you're on a Pat Wall show with Dr. Davis. Hi, Pat. How you doing? Good, sir. And, uh, yeah, Real quick, uh, you know, when I was I was wondering about this, you know, as soon as you mandate something, and you know, there, you know, some people might be affected, some people won't. So the small percentage that are affected, uh, who's going to pick up the tab? You know, basically on the people that are affected. You know, that's question number one. Is it written into the bill as it is currently, or is this something that's going to have to get you know, uh, legislature and everybody else involved to figure out what to do with the people that are affected? Uh, number two. You know, my children were homeschooled, but that went through the district. You know, so it went through the standard school district and whatnot. So even though they're homeschooled, usually uh, compliance comes about from the people who are funding it. So if the state of California is funding it, do I have to vaccinate my homeschooled kids now? Doctor, do you know anything about that? Uh, Unfortunately, Pat, not an area that I'm uh, qualified to discuss. I certainly haven't read the, the bill in a way that I would. Uh, be aware of what uh, financial remunerations are available, whether you're homeschooling or otherwise. So, sorry, Pat, I, I can't discuss that. Well, the, what I read, John, and I, and I hope I'm not misinforming you, John, and thank you for your call. What I read is that the only way that you would be, avoid it, and I, again, I could be wrong, it, avoiding the vaccinations if you don't want it, is to have your child, um, uh, your children homeschooled. Now, whether it's going, if you're going through the school and they're mandating this, and maybe there's a process that I'm not aware of, uh, if if that's the case, uh, Josh, do you know anything about this? Do you know how happened? Josh is still joining us. Do you do you know anything about the uh, homeschooling? If you haven't, uh, need to get you turned up. All right. If okay. you have a medical exemption, uh, then you can still attend school. Um, and what was the question? <laughs> Well, basically, if you if you're going to homeschool, does the kids or the schools that's going through their process? Does that mean that still they're going to have to be vaccinated? I guess the only way to do it is if you just don't comply with them and you just keep your kids at home and you just go homeschool. Yeah, they actually had to make an amendment for that. And yeah, no, uh, you can ha- you can have your child uh, not completely vaccinated and homeschool them. Okay, Adrian joining us from Roseville. Thank you, Josh. Adrian, you're on the Pat Wall Show with Josh and with Dr. Davis. Hi there. Um, I was listening to the show and for Dr. Davis, and I know um, this is, you know, you're a doctor in your profession, but a couple of things just struck my interest listening. First, it was talking about the autism doctor. No one ever really mentions his name, Dr. Wakefield, but it's come out from British Medical Journal that he's being cleared of these charges, same with the other doctor that was discredited with him. Nobody talks about that that his studies are proving to be valid and not false. Um, then we moved on to Gardasil, which is 
a, a vaccination that is harming so many people. And I can't believe anyone that has a daughter would be on board without learning and researching how many deaths and serious side effects have occurred from Gardasil, HPV specifically. That one's for you, Dr. Davis. Yeah, I, I can't say that I've, I've had any uh, interaction with specific data that has discussed deaths associated with an HPV vaccine. Again, I've reviewed this data with pretty substantial scrutiny, and I certainly am more than glad to look back at any data that's available but as I said, I've been more than confident in the data that I have reviewed uh, from substantial journals that I haven't had any questions or concern, not just vaccinating my daughter, but also my son uh, against HPV. And I, I haven't seen data on HPV-associated deaths with the, with the vaccine. Uh, and again, the, the data that's been associated with the, uh, the, the doctor that, that initially substantiated the data associated with autism. Uh, again, I'll, I'll stand by the data that's out there that suggested that this was not substantial data that we should be uh, accepting in the scientific journals. You know that that study the, uh, is still published in The Lancet. Dr. Wakefield's yeah. study is still published. Yeah, and, you know, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm published in a lot of journals, and I'm not going to say that, that everything that I've ever published was you know, substantial to quality that people couldn't look back and and potentially find flaws in data. Um, we also we also know that components of the Framingham data was also not uh, was not only not substantiated but was also falsified. So the fact that it was published in JAMA does not make it a necessarily a credible journal article. How about I've William been, Thompson? I've been, I've been publishing I've been publishing and researching for over twenty five years, and I can tell you the stuff that I've reviewed in journals in and of itself is not prima facie acceptable data just because it ends up in a journal. Um, I, this, is, this is something that I, I have to argue with my colleagues, my residents, and my fellows on a regular basis because you have to scrutinize the data from every iota of how it's constructed, how the data is, uh, the statistical methods that are associated. And again, I, I feel pretty confident in uh, the reviews that, that I have made of this data, and again, I'm not going to express myself as an expert in immunologic disorders, although I, I do have background in, in immunologic disease and, and immunology, um, but from the standpoint of my review of the articles, review of the critiques, I just, I feel that vaccination, you know, as, as it stands today, um, I, I understand that there are going to be people who are going to fight against it or who are going to feel that it's their, their right to say otherwise. I still look at the, the global medical community and even my children, and I say that this is something that I think that we need to uh, continue to be vigilant against well, and, I, and hope that others do. I have to say you've been very candid, open, and honest about that, and if you don't know something, you admit it, And uh, but you're very knowledgeable, obviously. A couple of real quick, because uh, I'm right up against it. I just First of all, uh, Dr. Davis, thank you for listening and calling in tonight and contributing to the show. It really is it's made for quite a good discussion. Two things. Uh, Josh brought up the measles at Disneyland. and Do you think that was overblown? And uh, I asked Josh this question. I'm going to ask you uh, if you could keep it somewhat brief here. Uh, again, I apologize time-wise. But um, you see people coming all the time representing big pharmaceutical companies. And there's a lot of money to be had there. Uh, do you feel that uh, there is? Uh, do you feel that there's anything behind that? That there's big money behind this from the phar- pharmaceuticals? And again, the, the measles outbreak at Disneyland. Well, I, I, you know, I think this, the whole rationale for people making the decision about vaccination based upon Disneyland, I, I agree. I think that that was completely overblown. This is one of those scenarios that it, it's not just because people weren't vaccinated. It was because. People were in a group, it could be college with meningitis. It could, you know, this isn't the reason to say, hey, now it's time to do something. I completely agree with that. Uh, there's no question. I see, you know, now in, in the academic industries, we see very few people from the pharmaceutical representatives because there was some concern about pharmacy and physicians meeting up face to face. So that's disappeared, at least from the academic centers. And I work in a very large academic center. Um, 
I, I, I think that in the smaller community offices, I think that maybe that may still play a role, but I think it's diminishing pretty substantially. Dr. Davis, again, thank you so much for contributing to the show tonight. It's really, uh, I really do appreciate that. Adrian, thank you. Josh, thank all of you. And for all of everyone who called up tonight, I do appreciate uh, you, uh, you know, your, uh, your, your comments. All right, um, listen, it's uh, what are the Girl Scouts up to? It's a pretty amazing story. And I got a couple of musical things we're going to get to. We're going to change, change it up. Uh, before we do that, though, it's at 9.30. That means bottom of the hour news, News Radio, KPK, Cindy Baker.